Hey, welcome back to Screen Crush. I'm Ryan Airy, and this is the definitive history of Wolverine. We are going to break down the full history of this character from the comics by legends such as Chris Claremont, Paul Jenkins, and Barry Windsor Smith to the now revived iconic animated series. And we actually interviewed Chris Claremont, Fabian Nicia, and Paul Jenkins about these iconic storylines that these men created. That's right, the people who actually shaped the history of Wolverine are going to be talking to us in this video. Let's Go. Wolverine first appeared in The Incredible Hawk number 180 in 1974 in a very brief cameo at the end of the issue. However, in the following issue, 181, Wolverine truly debuted in all his glory. Created by writer Len Wein and artist John Romita Sr., with the help of Herd Trimpey, Wolverine was first drawn to be fierce, mysterious, and fearless. You'd have to be if you're going to be taking on the big guy. First exposure to Wolverine in the comic was Wolverine's first appearance in the comic, which was Hulk 181. He slashed Hulk. Hulk punched him, he slashed Hulk, Hulk punched him more. You know, it was a standard Hulk story. And quite frankly, the character didn't make much of an impression on me one way or the other at that time. Everything about the Wolverine was in limbo. In the comic, Wolverine appears in his iconic blue and yellow battling against the Hulk. The Hulk had been mysteriously drawn to a cave by Marie Cartier and George Baptiste, trying to save her brother Paul from a terrible curse that turns him into the immoral being called the Wendigo. They plan to transfer the power of the Wendigo to the Hulk, thus restoring Paul Cartier to his normal life. During the Hulk's confrontation with Wendigo, Wolverine shows up on behalf of the Canadian government under the code Weapon X to capture and detain the Hulk. Marie then attempts and fails to perform the occult ritual on the Hulk, who immediately returns to fight Wolverine before Canadian officials intervene. Since his debut, Wolverine and the Hulk have remained intertwined in various comic series and cartoon events, sometimes as adversaries and sometimes as a friend from work. We know each other. He's a friend from work. Now, while we have yet to see them go toe to toe on the big screen in live action, we have an inkling that Jackman's return as Logan isn't just for Ryan Reynolds. Please. In these early appearances, Wolverine was depicted as a short and stocky Canadian mutant with a regenerative healing factor, retractable claws made of adamantium, that is, a virtually indestructible metal, and an animalistic Berker rage. His past was shrouded in mystery with only fragments of his memory intact. Now, this was intentional. I think the less you know about a character, the more interesting they are. Wolverine's rise to prominence began in 1975 when he became a member of the X-Men and giant-sized X-Men number one, penned by Ween and illustrated by Dave Cockrum. You have to put it in context. The X-Men was never an A-category series any more than Iron Man was. This pivotal issue signaled the start of the Bronze Age of comics and Wolverine's enduring affiliation with the team and other icons such as Storm, Colossus, Thunderbird, and Nightcrawler. Uh, the whole X-Men idea that Roy Thomas um, had, had percolated with Len Wein, Roy Thomas was the editor-in-chief basically at that time, they wanted it all to be international in scope, so having Wolverine already be Canadian from his appearance in Hulk made sense for them to, to just include him. The issue begins with Professor X needing to assemble a new team of X-Men to rescue the original members, Marvel Girl, Iceman, and Angel, excluding Beast who had already left the team, along with recruits Havoc and Polaris who vanished during a mission to the island of Krakoa, with Cyclops being the sole escapee. Professor X visits a government base in Quebec where he meets Major Chase and their Weapon X. Charles offers Wolverine the opportunity to join him and become a free agent, which Wolverine immediately accepts. Chase in protest, but Wolverine resigns from duty by cutting off his tie. Once the new team is gathered, Professor X uses his telepathic powers to teach them English so they can all communicate. Despite personality clashes among the members, the new team successfully rescues the original X-Men. During the mission, the team discovers that Krakoa is not merely an island, but also a giant mutant. Together, they defeat the entity by using Polaris's power to shoot it into outer space, ending the issue with a now-powerful roster of 13 X-Men. Fun fact, Gil Kane illustrated the cover artwork for this issue, but he incorrectly drew Wolverine's mask with the larger headpiece. Dave Cockrum liked Kane's accidental alteration. He thought the original was too similar to Batman's mask, and he incorporated it into his artwork for the actual story. Cockrum was also the first artist to draw Wolverine without his mask, and the distinctive hairstyle became one of the character's trademarks. Whoa, Lucy, what's with your hair? Even though characters introduced in the issue were well-received, Marvel's X-Men still struggled with sales. The series was on the verge of cancellation when writer Chris Claremont was Len Wein's replacement in 1975. When I came into the business the first, in 68, we were dying. The reason why I got X-Men wasn't just that Ben, that 
Len was leaving, it was because no one else wanted it. Claremont and artist Dave Cockrum were tasked with revitalizing this franchise. Claremont's vision included a diverse and multi-layer team that would focus on character-driven stories that explored personal growth, relationships, and complex moral dilemmas. This approach would resonate with readers, laying the foundation for the X-Men's enduring popularity. Readers read that and yeah, it's finding ways to define the characters, to present the characters in terms that the readers can embrace and relate to and forgive me with re respect to their own lives they're going through the same challenges in their lives that i am because i'm black or i'm hispanic or i'm islamic or i'm gay but as the new team took shape it took the creators a while to recognize wolverine's potential len said in an interview one time that he thought colossus was going to be the breakout big star of the new X-Men. And Dave Cockrum had a personal affinity for drawing Nightcrawler. So the first few issues of the new X-Men was very Nightcrawler focused in terms of little bits that were being revealed. Now because Wolverine was initially underused, favoring other members like Cyclops and Nightcrawler, Chris Claremont and Dave Cockrum considered dropping him from the lineup as the series progressed. However, Cockrum's successor, artist John Byrne, advocated for Wolverine, explaining that as a fellow Canadian, he did not want to see a Canadian character removed. Just a year or so later, he exploded because John Byrne, uh, as the co-plotter and artist on X-Men, took a huge liking to Wolverine and to drawing Wolverine, which meant he started to get more and more of the uh, of the attention in the X-Men book. During this era, Chris Claremont and artist John Byrne further developed Wolverine's character, highlighting his enigmatic past, berserker rage, and struggle with his animalistic nature. They worked to transform Wolverine from a one-dimensional character into a complex anti-hero, introducing key elements like Wolverine's healing factor and his connection to samurai culture. Uh, the original conception of Wolverine was that he was an adolescent. I took my cue from the way Dave drew the character, which seemed to me and to Dave Cockrum as a much older, more physically mature character. The Claremont Burn era also established Wolverine as an older mutant and showed that his adamantium claws were part of his anatomy. Now this contrasted with Wine's initial concept of a younger mutated Wolverine cub from the high evolutionary with claws apart from his uniform. And this was actually a key decision made early in Wolverine's story. It actually wasn't until uh, Chris Claremont and Dave Cockrum were doing the book I think it might have been issue 99, where um, his claws, for the first time you saw his claws popped out of his hand, and it wasn't a machine, it wasn't cybernetic or anything like that. Um, that, that was the moment where I said, oh, this guy's interesting, there's something more here. Wolverine's claws being a part of his body set him apart from every other hero on the X-Men and every hero at Marvel Comics. That evolved into not simply the adamantium claws coming out of his hand, but the adamantium wrapping itself around his skeletal structure. How did the people who did it get away with that? Presumably by exploiting his healing factor. So in that as aspect, his, his power, the thing that made him special and unique among the X team, was now responsible for making, for his greatest liability, which is he's almost the functional equivalent of a cyborg. And then, of course, there were the next series of questions, which is where did it come from? Who did it to him? Why? What is the purpose? And my traditional answer to it for as long as I could get away with was none of your damn business. And there was a point where Sabretooth was considered to be Logan's dad as well, but we're going to cover that later. Byrne modeled his depiction of Wolverine on actor Paul D'Amato, known for his role as Dr. Hook in the 1977 sports film Slapshot. They don't call me Dr. Hook for nothing. Byrne also designed the now classic brown and gold costume for Wolverine, removing the shoulder pads and tiger stripes while keeping Cockrum's distinctive cow. Cockrum had initially attempted to introduce a new costume for Wolverine, borrowed from his adversary Fang in the final issue of his run. It was discarded after one issue of Byrne's tenure because both artists found drawing it particularly difficult. The classic brown and gold was introduced at X-Men 139 along with the newest team member and longtime friend, Kitty Pride. In this issue, the team learns that Wolverine's real name is Logan. Chris Claremont chose this name inspired by Mount Logan, Canada's tallest mountain, as an ironic contrast to Wolverine being the shortest character on the team. This new look proved so popular that Logan wore it throughout most of the 1980s and into the early 1990s. Years later, after regaining his memories, Wolverine would don this costume again in the comics and the new X-Men 
X-Men 97 series. Chris Claremont's initial tenure as the writer of Uncanny X-Men, which spanned from issue 94 to 279, plus numerous spin-off books, limited series annuals, and specials, was a massive success. The series climbed from the bottom of the sales charts to become the leading title in the industry. I can look around and see an entire industry that has been shaped and defined by what I and a few artists did. It's realizing that, that the work I've done has has touched people that I never imagined. Claremont is responsible for starting Gene and Logan's now famous Will They Won't They romantic dynamic. In his earliest appearances as an X-Man, when Wolverine was overshadowed by his teammates, his most memorable moments often involved Gene Grey. If you were to dr uh, draw any kind of parallel with Logan and Gene, you could probably look at Romeo and Juliet and say that star-crossed lovers, right? And so it's this massively hot, and not necessarily cold, but like hot and difficult relationship that is tempestuous. Um, and that fits into the soap opera style of the X-Men. But that dynamic was so brilliantly done because, you know, you felt that relationship. I think anyone reading that for the first time loved the two characters being in love and then things get difficult for them. Uh, all of it was kind of icky to me. It always should have been unrequited love. That was the problem. It should have been unrequited love on Wolverine's part. Gene never should have reflected it back on him. If they had kept it as a three to five year storyline and subplots of unrequited love, then Wolverine would have come across all the more interesting and tragic as a result of it. Now, whether you find the Gene Logan pairing monotonous or not, the dynamic was electrifying enough to keep recurring in the comics and bleed into the cartoons and films. Personally, I find them more entertaining as a pair than Gene and Scott. Scott and Gene's energies are too similar, giving off head cheerleader and high school quarterback vibes. Yeah. Whatever. But Claremont felt Gene and Wolverine worked well together because Logan and Phoenix both share the burden of immortality. And why Mariko would never work for Logan as, as Scott would never work for Gene is that if you moved ahead 150 years, they would be dead. Love on that level for these two people is a transient act because the people they fall in love with are limited. The Days of Future Past storyline is another Claremont Byrne era staple. The story presents a dystopian future where Sentinels hunt mutants, where most X-Men have been killed and the few survivors, including an older Wolverine, are held in internment camps. Kitty Pride's consciousness is sent back in time to her younger self to prevent the assassination of Senator Robert Kelly by the Brotherhood of Evil Mutants, which then would lead to the rise of the Sentinel program. The story is considered one of the greatest X-Men stories of all time and has influenced numerous adaptations, including the film X-Men Days of Future Past. An older Wolverine plays a key role in attempting to prevent this future, showcasing his resilience and leadership. We started out by just, I don't want to do this. I don't want to do that. I don't want to do this. I don't want to do stupid fights. I don't want to do stupid fights. Um, can we make it about him? With the 1980s marking the rise of Wolverine's popularity, solo adventures were then commissioned for him. In 1982, he starred in his first limited series, Wolverine, written by Chris Claremont and illustrated by the great Frank Miller. If Wolverine is in a fight for his life, A, you can know he's not going to die. Okay, what can Frank and I do in the miniseries that is worse than actually dying? Humiliation. This four-issue series delved into Wolverine's time in Japan and his romantic involvement with Mariko Yoshida, adding depth to his character and unraveling more of his mysterious past. Claremont saw Wolverine as a character of duality, balancing his feral instincts with a sense of honor. He believed his complexity made Wolverine relatable and compelling. Miller also brought a noir-style aesthetic to the series, emphasizing Wolverine's gritty and darker aspects. He felt this approach resonated with readers looking for more mature comic themes. Claremont delivers a line from the first panel that would become synonymous with Marvel's most popular mutant. I'm the best there is at what I do, but what I do isn't very nice. Wolverine flies to Japan after Mariko's family hangs up on his inquiry about how she is. Now, he had met Mariko when the X-Men traveled to Agarashima, Japan. Lady Mariko Yoshida was heir to the powerful Yakuza family. Despite her initial fear, Mariko was soon comforted by Wolverine's presence and they both fell in love. As with most romantic interests with Logan, she is married another man, Noburu Hideko. After arriving to check on Mariko, Logan discovers her new husband has physically abused her and events turn violent. He discovers that she's engaged and her fiance has just beaten her within an inch of his life. Logan intended to kill Mariko's husband but was drugged and challenged to a duel of wooden swords by her father, Lord Shingen. But then he goes up against Shingen Yashida and the guy, you know, oh, well you have like adamantium claws. This isn't a fair fight. Okay, I'll fight you with 
Bo six. Sinjin beats the living daylights out of it because he's a better fighter. He's a better v villain than Wolverine is. Unsheathing his claws in desperation, Logan was further beaten and deemed an animal. All he's interested in is teaching Wolverine a message, a, be a lesson. He humiliates him. Logan was then cast into the streets where Yukio rescued him. She later became his close friend and occasional lover. After being attacked by the hand, Yukio manipulates Logan into helping her, leading to further embarrassment in front of Mariko. Realizing the deceit, Logan killed Lord Shingen in a duel after Yukio killed Mariko's husband. Mariko gives Logan the Clan Yoshida Masune sword. With her father and husband dead, Mariko becomes head of Clan Yoshida, and they announce their engagement. Now, before the wedding, Viper and Mariko's half-brother, Silver Samurai, poisons the X-Men. Logan fights for control of Clan Yoshida. He initially resents Rogue, but respects her after she saves Mariko from Viper. Now, due to family honor and Mastermind's manipulations, Mariko and Logan become estranged. Mariko returns to the sword, stating that she needs to sever her clan's criminal ties before they can remarry. Man, this guy has the worst luck with the ladies. Yeah, I know, buddy. So this story arc would be loosely adapted into the 2013 live-action film The Wolverine, directed by James Mangold and starring Hugh Jackman as Logan. And speaking of adaptations, Wolverine's first leap from page to small screen came in Spider-Man and His Amazing Friends, where he appeared in a few episodes. Voiced by William Calloway, this early version of Wolverine was a far cry from the character that we would come to know. For one thing, his accent was Australian. How you doing? Want a piece of fruit? And the portrayal lacked the depth and ferocity that readers had come to know the Canadian for. Just why? The creative team aimed to introduce Wolverine to a broader audience, leveraging his popularity from the comics. However, his portrayal was limited by the constraints of early 1980s children's television, which often toned down more violent, complex aspects of comic book characters. The miniseries was followed by the six-issue Kitty Pride in Wolverine, with Claremont again taking the helm as writer and Al Megram as the illustrator. Claremont crafted a fresh new perspective on Kitty Pride in Wolverine. Previously depicted as a sweet and innocent kid sister to the older X-Men, Kitty Pride is shown grappling with teenager self doubt and self-deprecation, searching for her soul and undergoing a coming-of-age transformation. Wolverine, meanwhile, is immersed in the honor-driven, mystical Japanese culture, transitioning from the X-Men's campy hard man to a grim and gritty character. Artist Al Milgram adapted his drawing style to match the dark and personal nature of the story, using bolder and more dynamic strokes. He was ultimately very satisfied with the project. It was perfect. After six issues, Claremont takes Kitty Pride from her breakup with Colossus in Uncanny X-Men 183, putting her through trials and confronting her inner demons and leading to her emergence as a stronger character. Claremont contrasts her journey with the battle-hardened Wolverine, establishing a platonic brother and sister-like relationship. This dynamic would become a recurring theme for Wolverine and his young female sidekicks, Jubilee being another one, for example. We even see this same dynamic used to introduce Wolverine to a wider audience in the movie X-Men. He befriends a young runaway, Rogue. And in the movie, he feels no attachment to the X-Men team, but he stays with them in order to help her. But I think this guy, Xavier, is one of them. He seems to genuinely want to help you, and that's a rare thing. So by pairing Wolverine with younger women, the audience sees that he is not just a mindless killing machine. He is a protector of the innocent. The same dynamic is what led to his heroic death in Logan, but more on that later. The series also solidified Kitty's superhero identity, settling on her costume and adopting the codename Shadowcat, which she would use from then on. On a roll, another Wolverine solo series, Wolverine, launched in 1988 and ran for 189 issues until 2003. Written initially by Chris Claremont and illustrated by John Bashima, the series delved into Logan's exploits as a lone warrior in his battles with inner demons and with Sabretooth. Sabretooth is Wolverine's arch enemy, his Joker, his Green Goblin. Now, they have similar powers, but Sabretooth represents the brutal savagery that Logan fights so hard to keep at bay. There's a point also where Sabretooth was considered to be Logan's dad as well. Everything that I've done with Sabretooth was based on my conception of him, which is that he was Wolverine's father. His mother was, she's an angel. Half of Wolverine is angelic which is the side of his room that's pristine. And the reason he embraced Japanese samurai ethos, or at least his perception of it, is because it was pure. In Wolverine Volume 2, Number 10, in the CD Madripoor bar, Logan reflects on past traumas involving his love, Silver Fox, and his nemesis, Sabretooth. Sabretooth has been intertwined with Wolverine's life for an extensive period. Although not blood-related to Wolverine, as the first film suggests, both share comparable powers and are products of the Weapon X program. However, while Wolverine strives to restrain the beast within, Sabretooth fully embraces it. Flashbacks reveal a violent confrontation in which Sabretooth admits to killing 
Silver Fox, sparking Logan's uncontrollable rage. The murder of Silver Fox was the first of Sabretooth's birthday surprises, where every year he tracks down Logan and tries to kill him on his birthday. This reminds Logan that even as he puts the years behind him, his past is never too far behind. And even as Logan becomes a hero, he can never escape his past as a murderer. Sabretooth kills him every year on his birthday because he wants Wolverine to fight back. And Wolverine, of course, being a pissy adolescent, deep down inside, is like, no, I'm not gonna do it. I'm just gonna stand here and let you beat the shit out of me because that's me. Claremont wasn't the only one making his mark with Wolverine. Barry Windsor Smith entered the fray in 1991 with his miniseries, Weapon X. I can see why Jim Shooter said yes because no editor would be stupid enough to refuse Barry when he walks in with 32 pages that he did on spec. Barry chose to explore Wolverine's origin story, detailing his time in the Weapon X program and the process that gave him his adamantium skeleton. It is a gritty and intense examination of Wolverine's traumatic past. In the Weapon X storyline, Logan, aka Wolverine, gets kidnapped by a secret government program called Weapon X. They put him through brutal experiments, bonding unbreakable adamantium to his skeleton and turning him into an almost indestructible weapon. The scientists, led by by Dr. Cornelius, Dr. Hines, and the cruel professor strip away Logan's humanity with cold precision. As they transform him, Logan endures horrific physical and psychological torture designed to make him a mindless killing machine, erasing most of his memories and leaving him at a primal rage. Eventually, his animal instincts and healing powers kick in, allowing him to escape the facility. In a feral state, Wolverine goes on a rampage, killing many of his captors as he fights to reclaim his sense of self and his humanity. For me, the first seminal work was Weapon X. Um, you know, and I took that as a metaphor for, you know, assault, basically, um, for sexual assault and rape, um, that he had basically had uh, a substance put inside him against his wishes, and he had been abused, and he had been through this terrible ordeal, and he had come out the other side. And so the, the power of the story really is about, like, like what, what happens when you get taken and, and abused and misused, and sort of like, you have to fight back. Windsor Smith was given significant creative control over this project. He wrote, illustrated, and even colored the series, ensuring a unified vision. This level of control is relatively rare in mainstream comics, allowing Windsor Smith to realize his artistic and narrative vision fully. Weapon X garnered critical acclaim for its mature storytelling and intricate artwork. It is frequently hailed as one of the greatest Wolverine stories and a landmark in comic book history, celebrated for its psychological depth and exploration of its themes of humanity. So did Logan ever go back with the X-Men? Oh yeah, for sure, Doug. Throughout the 1990s and 2000s, Wolverine remained central to many major story arcs in the X-Men comics. In a now classic issue, Madripoor Knights, by Claremont and illustrator Jim Lee, Wolverine meets Captain America for the first time in the summer of 1941, when they team up to fight the Hands Ninja Warriors. Madripoor, the most laid-back place in the Marvel Universe, played a big role in Wolverine's life. It was a key setting in his second solo series, Wolverine. Wolverine Origins number 16 would revisit this issue later, shedding light on various subplots involving Baron Strucker and the Hands Alliance. Also, fun fact, the comic appears in Weird Al's White and Nerdy. I've been browsing, inspecting X-Men comics, you know I collect them. That's my jam. Person, please stop. Sorry. Anyways, so another epic crossover event was Fatal Attractions. Now, this 1993 crossover, written by Fabian Nicia and Scott LaBelle and used as a reference in X-Men 97, commemorated the 30th anniversary of Marvel's X-Men. It was a little bit of a messy time in terms of creative stability. They, they didn't know when, when like, Jim and, and, and Rob and Wills uh, were going to be leaving uh, to do their image work. So there was a, a few month period there where it was all really kind of mushy. To this day, it's 30 years later, I was never officially offered the X-Men book. <laughs> so I had to hit the ground running with a, a three title, nine part crossover. Um, still not technically officially the writer of X-Men, just writing it for five, six months, especially during this multi-title crossover. In this massive issue, the Acolytes, a group of mutant soldiers led by Fabian Cortez, attack Camp Hayden, the headquarters for Project Wide Awake, which is defended by X-Factor. Simultaneously, Exodus approaches X-Force with an offer of sanctuary from Magneto, who is revealed to be alive and in control of Avalon a retrofitted version of Cable's base, Grey Malkin. Cable manages to save the sentient computer professor, but fails to destroy Avalon, barely escaping with his life. Magneto and the Acolytes then crash Ilyana Rasputin's funeral, prompting Colossus to join them in his grief. The UN activates the Magneto protocols, causing Magneto to retaliate with an electromagnetic pulse that disrupts global electronics. Professor X, with the team
team, including Jean Grey, Gambit, Rogue, Quicksilver, and Wolverine, infiltrates Avalon, disables it with the virus, and battles Magneto, who rips the adamantium from Wolverine's skeleton, which leads to Professor X mind-wiping Magneto into a coma. As the X-Men return to Earth, Wolverine regains consciousness in time to save Jean Grey from being sucked out of their turbulent ship, revealing his new bone claws. The idea came out of a writer's meeting um, we were out, I think we were out in Glen Cove, Long Island for an X summit. But it was X Factor writer Peter David who finally had the idea. Magneto has, has fought Wolverine a million times already. Why doesn't he just rip his, his, his adamantium out of him? And everyone sort of said, wow, that's really interesting because it opened up a lot of questions that were worth answering. This revelation meant that the claws were always a part of Wolverine's anatomy, just covered in metal, adding a new layer to his backstory and powers. So the idea of making a bone claws then allowed you to um, explore Wolverine's background more, his, his origins, what he remembers or doesn't remember. I believe back then even he was surprised that he had bone claws. This moment also pushed Wolverine into a feral state, reflecting the deep trauma and shock of losing his adamantium. Wolverine temporarily departs from the X-Men, embarking on a series of adventures during which his healing factor returns. Due to his feral nature, his mutation process will eventually cause him to degenerate physically into a more primitive, beast-like state. Fans saw a raw, more animalistic side of Logan as he struggled to Hope without his metal skeleton. The shift highlighted his resilience, adaptability, and constant battle with his primal instincts. Wolverine's healing factor, training, and bone claws still made him a tough opponent, but the absence of his adamantium was noticeable. In Wolverine number 145 by Eric Larson and Lanil Francis Yu, Apocalypse offers to rebond the adamantium to Logan's skeleton if he becomes one of his horsemen. Logan initially refuses, but Apocalypse clarifies that this is an audition, not an offer. Wolverine must fight his old enemy Sabretooth, who also has an adamantium lace skeleton for the role of death. Faced with the dilemma of becoming a killing machine or letting someone worse take the position, Wolverine decides to fight Sabretooth. Despite Sabretooth's metallic advantages, Wolverine wins and reluctantly accepts the role of death, thinking that he can resist the programming. Apocalypse successfully rebonds the adamantium skeleton to Wolverine using metal taken from Sabretooth. Forced to serve Apocalypse, Wolverine completes several missions, including fighting Hulk and killing a Skrull imposter among the X-Men. Eventually, with the X-Men's help, Wolverine does break free from Apocalypse his control and returns to the team. You just don't know when to give up, do you? I'm gonna do this all day. This experience shows that Wolverine is just as formidable with or without his adamantium. In 1991, Chris Claremont's final story for the X-Men was created in collaboration with artist Jim Lee, resulting in the launch of a new series, X-Men Volume 2, also known as X-Men Mutant Genesis. In this series, particularly issues 1 through 3, feature Claremont's last major Magneto storyline and mark the culmination of his 17-year tenure with the X-Men. So, so Chris, Chris was basically a, a bit of an institution within the company, deservedly so. They were getting really anxious about the fact that I wouldn't go away and that that people were thinking of the X-Men as more and more my stuff than Marvel stuff. The first issue of this new series broke all previous sales records, underscoring the massive popularity that Claremont had built for the X-Men, ultimately making them one of the most significant entities in the comic book industry. I would, would wanted to go in new directions and see if we could re-energize and excite the audience of the 90s and keep building the X-Men the way that I'd been building it the previous 15, 18 years. 17 years is a long time for anyone to stay on one project, and Chris Claremont certainly made the most of it with the X-Men. He introduced a diverse range of characters and pioneered the concept of big crossover events, which have since become a staple in comics. His work shaped the future of the comic book industry and inspired artists who took his stories beyond the medium. Claremont's influence is still felt today in the broader world of entertainment. The 1990s revolutionized animated superhero series, and X-Men, the animated series, led the charge. The show was key in shaping Wolverine for a new generation of comic book fans. For most millennials, it was their introduction to superheroes and comics, sparking a lifelong love for the genre. Voiced by Cal J. Dodd, Wolverine was depicted as a gruff, no-nonsense hero with a heart of gold, balancing his animalistic rage with deep loyalty and compassion for his teammates. Dodd's voice work brought a new dimension to Wolverine, capturing his gruff exterior and hidden vulnerability. Someday I'll learn not to let my guard down. Oh, oh no! Gene.
The creators, including writers like Eric Lewald and artists such as Will Maginot, worked to ensure the animated series stayed true to the spirit of the comics. The decision to make Wolverine a central character was driven by his popularity and rich storytelling potential that he offered. Fans and critics praised the series for its mature storytelling and complex character development. Wolverine's portrayal was a standout, earning acclaim for its faithfulness to the comics and ability to resonate emotionally with viewers. The creators of the show were careful to balance each of the X-Men's strengths with the weakness. For instance, Rogue is passionate but cannot touch. For Logan, his body can heal any wound, but his broken heart can never heal. In two key episodes of the series, Wolverine tries to step away from the life of a warrior. He lives with an Inuit tribe in Alaska before Sabretooth destroys the village. And in a retelling of the classic Claremont Miller series, he seeks a life of peace in Japan, but his violent skills always draw him back into a fight. I'm sorry. I came to find myself, not to fight. Thanks to this series' popularity, the X-Men were brought to the gaming world and the big screen. If you saw a trailer for a movie, it might well say, you know, um, Hugh Jackman is Wolverine. And if you see the trailer for a video game, it says you are Wolverine. And, and your job as a writer and, and as a game designer, your job is to give this character to somebody to let them become that person. That character is somebody that you want to go and basically blow some stuff up with, right? You want to do that with Wolverine. The X-Men's explosive comic sales and multiple spin-off titles in the early 90s coincided with a new boom in the video game industry. X-Men games were created for cabinet arcade machines, but also the new Super Nintendo and Sega Genesis systems. Actually, the first X-Men games were the DOS-based Madness and Murder World and The Fall of the Mutants, but the next outing was a Wolverine solo game for the NES. This was an original story where Magneto and Sabretooth trapped Wolverine on an island and he had to escape. And then it was followed up by a loyal adaptation from the comics. Oh, did they adapt Dark Phoenix or Days of Future Past? No. They adopted a two-issue arc where X-Men teamed up with Spider-Man to fight a villain called Arcade. Not a great game, but you could climb walls with Wolverine's claws. That was pretty sweet. So this was followed up by Capcom's X-Men the Arcade Game and Children of the Atom. These are classic beat-em-ups that laid the groundwork for the Marvel vs. Capcom series. And these were followed up with the magnificent X-Men the Arcade Game, which even though it was a fun multiplayer arcade game, it did penalize you energy for using a mutant's powers. This was followed by the classic X-Men for Sega Genesis, which was followed up by another solo Wolverine game, Adamantium's Rage, where you discover the secrets of Wolverine's past. So each of these games laid important groundwork for the next, adding in elements like more detailed stories and improving how you use Wolverine's powers in the game. As console technology evolved, so did the gameplay. And as we'll talk about later, the games would soon start incorporating elements from the X-Men film franchise. So now let's talk about X-Men. Hugh Jackman's portrayal of Wolverine debuted in this film, setting the stage for an iconic portrayal. The casting of Hugh Jackman as Wolverine was a stroke of serendipity. Initially, the role was offered to Doug Ray Scott, but due to scheduling conflicts with Mission Impossible 2, the part became available. I about to do it, and then my, the movie I was doing at the time just overran by so much that I, I couldn't do it in the end, so that was the story. They looked for who's on, who's on the list, and so she sends in Hugh Jackman, and they said, yeah, come on. Okay, he won the Olivier for Best Actor, but it was Best Actor in Oklahoma, a musical. Oklahoma, when the wind comes sweeping down the plain. He can sing and dance. Great. Can he do Wolverine? And so she sent him in to do the audition, and 36 hours later, he's on a plane to Calgary. Jackman, relatively unknown outside of Australia then, was suggested by his wife, Deborah Lee Furness, and eventually cast by director Brian Singer. You know, there was, I didn't even know, I'd never heard of X-Men. I didn't right. know there was an animal called a wolverine. Jackman had only three weeks to prepare for the role. At 6'3", he was significantly taller than the comic book character, who was supposed to be 5'3". To compensate, he adopted a crouched posture and incorporated animalistic movements inspired by wolves and big cats. The fans are not going to have a problem because the character is meant to be five foot five. And I said, Tom, really, it's going to be absolutely fine. Don't worry about a thing. He also underwent an intense physical transformation, working with trainers to bulk up for the role. Just to do it the old school way. And I tell you, I've, I've eaten more chickens. I'm so sorry to 
all the vegans and vegetarians and to the chickens of the world. Jackman's Wolverine was a breakout character, praised for his depth and intensity. The movie proved that Marvel properties could work on the big screen, and it expanded superhero cinema beyond just, you know, Superman and Batman. The movie and Hugh Jackman began the Marvel age of movies. With the success of the film and Jackman's performance came X-Men Evolution. X-Men Evolution reimagined the X-Men as teenagers, with Wolverine taking on more of a mentor role. Notice how he's drawn to look like Hugh Jackman. In this series, he is voiced by Scott McNeil. Neil, who worked to retain the character's signature toughness, but added layers of wisdom and guidance, highlighting his protective nature toward the younger mutants. What do you think you're doing here, bub? Those things could have taken your empty head right off! The show's producers, including Boyd Kirkland and Greg Johnson, aim to appeal to a younger audience while retaining the core elements of the X-Men mythology. The show ran for four seasons, despite being met with mixed reactions from fans and critics. X2 X-Men United explores more of Wolverine's past with Weapon X, deepening his character arc. Director Brian Singer and the writers focused on Wolverine's backstory, with Jackman performing many of his own stunts to bring authenticity. Once again, Jackman was thrust to the front of the narrative. The film's script allowed Jackman to explore a more nuanced side of Wolverine, showing both his protective nature and his feral instincts. His performance perfectly captures Logan's internal struggle with his identity and his brutal past. Jackman's commitment to the physicality of Wolverine was evident. He trained rigorously to maintain and improve his physique, enduring long hours of choreography for fight scenes. His dedication was particularly noted in the scene where Wolverine defends the mansion, showcasing his ferocity in combat. <laughs> Fans appreciated the deeper dive into Wolverine's past, and the film was critically acclaimed, making it into one of the all-time greatest X-Men movies. It's my personal favorite. And speaking of diving deeper into Wolverine's past, enter Paul Jenkins. Paul Jenkins is an acclaimed comic book writer, known for his work on titles such as The Inhumans, Spider-Man, and Hellblazer. I was invited to a editorial conf conference, basically. Halfway through the day, the publisher, Bill Jemis, came up to me, and he asked me, Paul, why are you um, grumpy. And I said, you're supposed to be the house of ideas. And every time someone has a good one, you say no. And he said, what do you have in mind? I said, I don't know, you know, something like the origin of Wolverine. And he said, that sounds great. Like, you're right. I've been thinking the same thing, that we should be doing the origin of Wolverine. We almost said it at the same time, to be honest. When Jenkins took on Wolverine in the 2000s, he aimed to explore the character's past, identity, and trauma. Wolverine Origin is perhaps Jenkins' most significant contribution to Wolverine's lore. This six-issue limited series, co-written with Joe Cazada and Bill Jemis and illustrated by Andy Kubert, finally revealed the long-guarded secret of Wolverine's past. But revealing the origin was controversial among fans and fellow comic book creators. Really fueled him, what really what really created him was his mystery. That the revelation of those mysteries is always a conflict for the creative people. You, you always worry about revealing too much or revealing it poorly. Chris, you know, I talked with him a little bit about his approach to it because I was this kind of upstart. You know, I came in and I'm writing the origin of Wolverine and I'm not so sure that Chris thought that was a good idea. Paul had a good idea. It was a, it's a, a very good story. I fundamentally disagree with it because once you tell the story, you can't take it back. To do an origin, no matter how well it works, or is you're locking things down. You're saying this is it. I preferred more ambiguity. I, I, I've never read the, the origins comic that they did. Um, I, I didn't read it because quite honestly, I didn't, think it was anyone else's story to tell but Chris. But that's okay, that's just kind of like an intellectual kind of discourse between the two of us. Set in the late 19th century, the story traces Logan's childhood, the emergence of his powers, and the tragic events that led to his transformation into Wolverine. Origin focuses on Wolverine's struggle with his true identity, revealing his birth name, James Hallett, and the traumatic events that shaped his early life. If you take a look at a character like Wolverine, the only thing we pitched was not you know, this is going to expose every single aspect of his life. I, the, the very specific pitch was, why don't we tell a couple of the things that people have wondered about? Like, where was he born? What was his name? And why did he forget? That's it. We really didn't do much more than that. Um, I put my own personal story into the book. 
Um, so the first book is called The Hill. In the issue, an orphaned girl named Rose O'Hara is brought to the Howard estate to keep him company. James Rose and Dog Logan, the son of the cruel groundskeeper Thomas Logan, become friends, even though their fathers have ill will toward each other due to James's mother, Elizabeth. And the idea was that up there in the farmhouse is the other world, you know, where the, the rich people live and they have electricity and so on. Well, you know, most people didn't know this about me until I started talking about it maybe five years ago. You know, I grew up in real poverty and um, I was a single mom. My dad left when I was five and um, my brother and I were raised in, you know, without electricity most of the time. Uh, it was very hard to find food to eat, but we lived on a farm. Dog, influenced by his abusive father, grows increasingly violent over the years, ultimately leading to his and Thomas's removal from the estate. Thomas later returns to rob the estate and convinces Elizabeth to leave with him, hinting at an affair. When John Howard interrupts, Thomas kills him, triggering James's mutation and his claws first manifestation, which he uses to kill Thomas. Horrified, Elizabeth rejects James. James then escapes with Rose, ending up in a stone quarry where James adopts the name Logan. Over the years, he becomes physically stronger, although his memory remains fragmented due to childhood trauma. Logan's feelings for Rose complicate their lives, especially when Dog returns for revenge, resulting in Rose's accidental death at Logan's hands. Consumed by grief, Logan retreats into the wilderness, living as a wild animal and forgetting his past. The comic explores the dichotomy of Logan's animalistic nature versus his inherent humanity, setting the stage for his lifelong struggle with his dual identity. The decision to reveal Wolverine's origin was controversial. Right. Well, like Lin Wen said, I think the less you know about a character, the more interesting they are. The mystery of Logan's past was a key character element that fans enjoyed. Jenkins and the rest of the creative team faced the challenge of crafting a backstory that would live up to fans' expectations while maintaining the character's mystique. Well, he didn't have to worry. Origin was widely acclaimed. Fans and critics praised the series for its emotional depth, compelling narrative, and beautiful artwork. It is considered a milestone in Wolverine's history, providing a definitive account of his origins while preserving the complexity of his character. Paul Jenkins' time writing for Wolverine was marked by a profound exploration of the character's psyche and set a new standard for character-driven storytelling in superhero comics, influencing future writers and enriching Wolverine's legacy. Wolverine The End is another notable work by Jenkins. It is a six-issue limited series that imagines Wolverine's final adventure. Set in a dystopian future, the story follows an older Logan as he confronts ghosts from his past and seeks closure for his troubled life. In the end, he was given a chance to be happy, and he, but he, but he kind of couldn't be. You know, it was very difficult for him to, to retire. It was very difficult for him to be sitting there and enjoying his life in the cabin and doing all the stuff because he had these things that he could never solve. And I think that what happens with Wolverine is that he carries all these difficult things. He can't seem to let them go. Jenkins delves into Wolverine's complicated family dynamics, highlighting his quest for redemption and reconciliation with his estranged brother, John Hallett Jr. The narrative emphasizes the inevitability of endings while suggesting the possibility of new beginnings, portraying Wolverine's journey as a quest for peace and resolution. And for his entire life, he had had a, an itch that he could never scratch. He wanted to make these people pay. So the story was very much about going back and finding Weapon X, finding them. And, um, and taking them down. And yet when he gets there to confront his abuser, they're already gone, they've been gone for 50 years because sometimes people do not get to confront their abuser. And so the story was so much about like, well then what do I do? If I can't take them down like I would, that, that would be Logan's thing. He would want to dismantle them and just tear their heads off and throw them down the road. But if he couldn't do that, well then what does he do? And at that point, it was this awakening for him, even at his advanced age, that maybe, maybe I just sail off into the sunset. Maybe I can, maybe I can rest because I, it's not about forgiving them or taking them down. It's about forgiving myself for something that wasn't my fault. The comic book universe gained renewed popularity thanks to Hugh Jackman's performance of Wolverine. And thank God, because after a decline following the Onslaught saga, the X-Men comics hit a real rough patch for about six years until Grant Morrison revitalized them with new X-Men 114. When Grant Morrison took over, he aimed to modernize and streamline the X-Men mythos while injecting it with a unique blend of science fiction, social commentary, and the ethical implications of mutant powers. Who died and left Aristotle in charge of ethics? Plato.
He collaborated with artists like Frank Quiley and Igor Cordy, whose distinctive styles brought his visionary concepts to life. The artwork complemented Morrison's narrative ambitions, creating a visually stunning and thematically rich comic book experience. His initial arc, E is for Extinction, introduced radical changes to the X-Men universe, including the Genosha Massacre that was featured in X-Men 97. Save as many as you can. We shall not live our days wondering if we could have saved more. Fans appreciated Morrison's fresh take on the characters and the new look that ditched the old spandex for leather jackets and turtlenecks. Wolverine and Beast got makeovers too. Beast became more beastly, which was not well received, and Wolverine swapped his classic costume for a casual outfit inspired by the X-Men movies. Hey, didn't they just make a joke about that in X-Men 97? What'd you expect? Black leather? Correct, Doug. It was hilarious for comic book fans who enjoyed the yellow spandex. You know, like me. In the comic, Morrison introduced Cassandra Nova, Xavier's long-lost twin who caused havoc in Genosha, and she was such a standout villain. Cassandra Nova's villainy earned her the title of Villain of the Year in 2001 from Wizard Magazine, cementing her impact on X-Men lore. She's also the main antagonist in Deadpool and Wolverine. Boys are so silly. Grant Morrison's portrayal of Wolverine focused on exploring his complex psychology and the consequences of his long life. He explored Wolverine's origins and ties to the Weapon Plus program, a secretive organization dedicated to developing super soldiers for future wars who were also responsible for Weapon X, adding layers and layers to his backstory. Morrison's run with the X-Men also examined the dynamic between Cyclops and Wolverine, highlighting their contrasting leadership styles and philosophical differences. It's nice to see that they are actually bros when they're not fighting over Gene. The thing I loved about Grant loved and hated about Grant Morrison's run on New X-Men is that I disagreed with almost every primary decision he made, but I couldn't stop reading. While Wolverine remained prominent in the X-Men comics, solo adventures continued examining Logan's complex history. Wolverine has always been known as the best of what he does, and the Marvel Universe saw exactly what that meant in the iconic storyline, Enemy of the State. First published in 2004 and written by Mark Millar and illustrated by John Romita Jr., this tale takes Wolverine on a dark journey where he is brainwashed by the hand, turning him into a relentless assassin. Friends and foes are in danger as even old allies become potential targets during Wolverine's most unhinged rampage. Although Logan eventually regains control of his mind, he's left haunted by the horrific actions that he was forced to commit. The story also showed us how Wolverine would do in a fight against the other heroes in the Marvel Universe, when the entire system worked to bring him down. In the 2000s, Marvel was bouncing back from their 90s bankruptcy by doubling down on character-based storytelling that reinvented 40 years of continuity. The X-Men were relaunched in an alternate universe as the Ultimate X-Men, which imagined an edgier team. For instance, Wolverine even tries to kill Cyclops at one point. And just like like in newer video games such as X-Men Legends, this new version of Wolverine looked a lot like Hugh Jackman from the films. So while that was happening in the Ultimate Universe, in the main Marvel Comics universe, the House of Ideas reformed the Avengers and then stacked the team with the top-selling characters in the company. Writer Brian Michael Bendis said that they were emulating the Justice League of America, which always felt like a bargain because your favorite characters were all in the same book. So this new Avengers comic featured heavy hitters like Captain America, Iron Man, Spider-Man, Luke Cage, and Wolverine. So this ushered in a new era where Wolverine seemed omnipresent in titles outside of the X-Men universe, as Marvel was quicker to use his popularity to juice sales in the post-Claremont era. The comic Wolverine Origins was written by Daniel Way and illustrated by various artists, and the series examined Wolverine's past further. It delves into his relationships with characters like Sabretooth, Dokken, and Romulus. Dokken? He is Wolverine's son. See, in 1940s Japan, Logan fell in love with a woman named Itsu, who became pregnant with their son. Tragically, the ancient wolf warrior Romulus kills Itsu and cuts the baby from her womb, framing the Winter Soldier. Logan, unaware of Romulus's involvement in his life, is shocked to learn decades later that the son he thought was dead is still alive. Emma reveals that Wolverine has a son, Dokken, who is hateful toward his father. Wolverine tries to free Dokken, facing Omega Red and getting help from Black Widow and S.H.I.E.L.D. Dokken, manipulated by Romulus, eventually allies with and betrays several characters. Wolverine collaborates with Professor X to restore Dokken's memories, revealing Romulus's influence. After several conflicts, including with the Dark Avengers, Wolverine Wolverine continues his quest to confront Romulus and save Dokken. So as Wolverine became more of a teacher in an institution, for once it's Wolverine who has to reel in the murderous bad guy, placing him in the same situation he placed Scott in in the early days of Giant Size X-Men. And speaking of saving... 
And this is gonna hurt, folks. X-Men The Last Stand closes out what could have been a really solid X-Men trilogy. Once again, this film had Wolverine at the heart of its story as it dealt with elements of the famous Dark Phoenix saga. Elements meaning basically just in name only. So why does this movie suck? Well, the problems with X-Men The Last Stand can be traced back to behind the scenes issues. After Brian Singer left the project to work on Superman Returns, 20th Century Fox brought in director Matthew Vaughn and screenwriter Zach Penn and Simon Kinberg. The third X-Men film was originally supposed to focus on the iconic Dark Phoenix storyline, which had been set up in X2. Initially, Fox thought the storyline was just too dark. Still, screenwriters Zach Penn and Simon Kinberg pushed back, leading to a compromise where the Phoenix storyline was balanced with a plot about the mutant cure inspired by a recent comic by Joss Whedon. This resulted in two competing storylines that weren't seamlessly integrated, leaving both underdeveloped and unsatisfying. Director Matthew Vaughn left early in the project, feeling rushed, and was replaced by Brett Ratner, who prioritized meeting the release deadline over storytelling. This led to scheduling conflicts for key actors, resulting in reduced roles. Cyclops is killed off early due to James Marsden's commitment to Superman Returns. Rogue takes the cure and exits because Anna Paquin is filming another movie, and Mystique is quickly written out because Rebecca Romaine had other commitments as well. Now, although it received mixed reviews, Wolverine's character arc was praised. You would die for them. No, not for them. For you. I love you. Jackman's portrayal of Logan's love and pain for Jean added emotional weight to the mixed bag narrative. It was clear that he still kept the fans engaged, even if the movie didn't. The Messiah Complex saw Wolverine truly embrace his role as a team leader of the newly established X-Force. Now, in the past, Wolverine was defined by his role as an outsider, but as he became a cultural institution on the big screen, he became a character institution in the comics. This inspired the 2008 animated series with a Jackman-like Wolverine as the leader of the X-Men. In this series, Wolverine steps up as the leader of the X-Men after Professor X is incapacitated. Voiced by the great Steve Blum, Wolverine's character arc is marked by his struggle to unite the team and protect mutant kind in the face of growing threats. The creators, including head writer Greg Johnson, face the challenge of depicting Wolverine as a leader while staying true to his lone wolf persona. Blum's voice work added a new level of gravitas and complexity to the character, emphasizing his inner conflict and dedication to his team. Blum would even go on to voice Wolverine in the animated film Hulk vs. Wolverine, what the hell happened? Where Logan faces off against the Hulk in a brutal showdown. This directed video feature captures the two characters' intense rivalry and mutual respect and pays homage to Wolverine's debut appearance. The film's creators focused on delivering high octane action while delving into Wolverine's past and his connection to Weapon X. The dynamic animation and strong voice performances highlight Wolverine's resilience and his unbreakable spirit. Hulk vs. Wolverine has received generally positive reviews and is often regarded as one of the better direct to video Marvel movies. While Wolverine and the X-Men was short-lived, one comic that came out that same year would become another pivotal moment for the character. Old Man Logan, written by Mark Millar and illustrated by Steve McNiven, is set in a dystopian future where supervillains have conquered the world. An older, retired Wolverine is forced to embark on a dangerous journey across a wasteland in America. In this storyline, Wolverine is a broken man living a quiet life with his family in what used to be California, but is now part of Hulkland. He hasn't used his claws in 50 years after a tragic event following the deaths of the X-Men. Struggling to pay rent to the Hulk gang, who are descendants of Bruce Banner, Logan gets a visit from a blind, elderly Hawkeye who offers him a job to earn the money he needs. The duo sets off on a perilous journey across a villain-dominated America. Along the way, they face various threats and encounter a dystopian world filled with danger and loss. Logan eventually discovers that the package they are delivering contains a super soldier serum for a fake resistance movement. After Hawkeye is killed, Logan confronts the Red Skull, decapitates him, and escapes in Iron Man's armor. Upon returning home, Logan finds his family were murdered by the Hulk gang, prompting him to unleash his claws for the first time in half a century. And then he takes brutal revenge on the Banner family. He then sets off with Baby Banner as a new member of his family. The story received critical acclaim for its innovative premise and character-driven narrative and would go on to be loosely adapted in Hugh Jackman's Logan, along with the presence of his clone, Laura. Earlier we talked about how the decades have seen Wolverine slowly grow from a loner to a mentor to teenage sidekicks to become the headmaster of a school, and the creation of a Wolverine family is another milestone to show his maturity. Now, it is common for comic book companies to exploit a character's popularity by creating a family of heroes, but in recent years, this idea has become literal. As superheroes like Superman approach their 100th birthday, we have seen heroes like the Man of Steel, Batman, and Wolverine begin to take on the roles of parents. In addition to his biological son, Dakin, the aforementioned clone of Wolverine, X-23, is like a daughter to him. This has evolved Wolverine to look beyond his past and to the next generation, and to attempt to 
set these kids on a path that will help avoid his own fall into savagery. But Logan's savage past is what will always define him, and it also redefines him for new generations in the comics. For instance, Wolverine Weapon X was released in 2009 by writer Jason Aaron and illustrated by various artists. This series ran for 16 issues, exploring Wolverine's history with the Weapon X program and his never-ending struggle with his past. Jason Aaron wanted to explore Wolverine's past in the Weapon X program more thoroughly, digging into themes like government experimentation and moral dilemmas. One of the highlights was introducing Strike Force X, a group of super soldiers with laser claws that posed a serious threat to Wolverine and added a new layer to the Weapon X story. The addition of futuristic elements and time-traveling cyborg assassins like the Deathlocks brought a sci-fi twist to this tale, expanding the scope of Wolverine's battles. The story reimagined Wolverine's origin through the lens of horror and sci-fi, but most importantly, the story made it clear that the Weapon X program isn't just a part of Wolverine's past. It's an existing and evolving threat in the present. The program is still trying to create an updated version of Wolverine. So, in the present day, as he becomes more civilized and takes on leadership roles, his violent past is always just behind him, threatening to erase his new life. Strike Force X are humans enhanced with Wolverine's animal-like senses, strength, reflexes, and healing factor. This highlighted how Wolverine's powers are nothing more than a commodity for the powerful to exploit. And I'm sure it's just a coincidence that Aaron wrote this story as Wolverine seemed omnipresent in so many Marvel titles and in every X-Men movie, even in the prequels. Critics and fans appreciated the blend of old and new elements in Wolverine's story, maintaining respect for the character's legacy while introducing fresh threats and challenges. It was a perfect a comic to get people pumped up for Jackman's first solo outing as Wolverine. Yeah, plus the first appearance of Ryan Reynolds as Deadpool. Well, it's the first appearance of something like a Deadpool. Hey, it's me. Don't scratch. X-Men Origins Wolverine focused on Logan's early life and Weapon X's origins. So not only did Hugh Jackman star in this movie, but he also served as a producer, giving him more creative control over the character's portrayal. The film is basically a disaster though. It faced major criticism for its storyline and special effects, but Jackman's performance was consistently praised. He continued his rigorous physical training and delved deep into Logan's psyche, exploring themes of loss, revenge, and identity. The writer strike going on at the time impacted the script quality. One common complaint was about Wade Wilson's dialogue. Ryan Reynolds originally wrote his own lines for the film because of the strike. When he came on set, the only direction he got was that Wade Wilson shows up and talks really fast. You look really nice today. It's the green brings out the seriousness in your eyes. What also didn't help the film was that it was leaked months before the release. Many fans watched the pirated version and were disappointed with how some of their favorite characters, like Deadpool, were portrayed. So their solution, and I really don't like it, I think it was a poor solution, was that he gets shot in the head with an adamantium bullet or something, right? And that's why he forgets. And it's really banal. Um, I think it was just poorly conceived and it wasn't anywhere near as useful or understandable as the fact that he had PTSD and his mind papered over the cracks. Despite these issues, Jackman remained dedicated, often performing his stunts and working closely with the director to ensure Wolverine's character stayed true to his roots. The movie is indicative of a studio with a franchise on its hands that it didn't know what to do with. Just look at the title, X-Men Origins, Wolverine. This is because Fox hoped to spin off the successful X-Men characters into their own individual franchises. So they thought that they still needed X-Men somewhere in the title instead of just calling the movie Wolverine Origins. As a result, the movie is packed with needless cameos that for some reason feel the need to pack in Professor X, Cyclops, and all of these other young mutants so it can serve as a prequel to the original film. The movie was a rushed, slapdash effort, and hey, we all remember those cartoon Roger Rabbit claws, right? A better received release that came out alongside the movie was the X-Men Origins Wolverine video game by Raven Software and Amaze Entertainment. This action-adventure game lets players dive into Logan's fierce combat style. Origins, featuring lots of blood and gore, was inspired by games like God of War and Devil May Cry. If you had an Xbox 360 or a PlayStation 3, Raven Software offered you the Uncaged Edition. They improved on past Wolverine games by adding a progressive damage system. When Wolverine gets shot or stabbed, you see his injuries heal in real time, with his flesh, muscles, and skin growing back, eventually revealing his adamantium skeleton. He also has enhanced feral senses, which help solve puzzles, find hidden escape routes, and spot opponents' weak points. The Uncaged Edition received good reviews, with Greg Miller stating, for example, that Uncaged Edition is some of the most violent fun I've had in a long, long time. Back in the comics, the exact same cartoon title, Wolverine and the X-Men, Wolverine parts ways with Cyclops and opens up a new school in Westchester, New York, called the Jean Grey School for Higher Learning. Now, the writer, Jason Aram, teamed up with artist Chris Bocchel 
Angelo to create a unique blend of humor, drama, and action. They wanted to show a different side of Wolverine, focusing on his new role as headmaster of the Jean Grey School for Higher Learning. This setup allowed them to explore the character in a leadership position, juggling school duties while dealing with various threats, like the Hellfire Club. This showed Wolverine's story finally coming full circle, so of course, they killed him off in the death of Wolverine. Right, did you just say the death of Wolverine? I did indeed, Doug, just like Superman and Batman. Marvel decided it was time to kill Wolverine, but we'll get to that in a second. Wolverine is about to go anime. Marvel Anime X-Men presented a unique take on Wolverine, blending Western and Japanese storytelling styles. Voiced by Riki Koyama in Japanese and Milo Ventimiglia in English for the standalone story and Masato Hagiwara and Steve Blum in the X-Men series, these versions of Wolverine were grittier and more introspective, reflecting the darker tone of the series. The collaboration between Marvel and Madhouse, a renowned Japanese animation studio, aimed to create a fresh, global perspective on the X-Men. The anime's visual style and thematic depth provided a new platform to explore Wolverine's character, emphasizing his struggles with identity and honor. You see, it ain't smart to bet against me in a fight. I've got nothing to lose. Now, the next feature film, The Wolverine, takes Logan to Japan to deal with mortality and past demons. Directed by James Mangold, the film drew inspiration from Claremont and Miller's 1982 series. The film focuses on his grief after the events of The Last Stand and his quest for redemption. I'll never hurt you or anyone ever again. James Mangold wanted the film to be set after the previous X-Men movies so they could explore Wolverine's immortality without worrying about prequel rules or fitting into another storyline. Thus, Jackman's portrayal of a more introspective and vulnerable Wolverine was a departure from the usual action-centric depiction. For The Wolverine, Jackman aimed to achieve a leaner, more defined look. His diet and training regimen were even more intense, involving dehydration techniques for certain scenes to enhance muscle definition. Jackman's commitment to the physical aspect of the role was unparalleled, often pushing himself to extreme pain. Don't do this at home. It's really, you, you increase your water intake, and then you stop about 36 hours before you shoot, but you lose like 10 pounds of all of this water weight. The film was well received for its character-driven approach. Jackman's performance was praised for its depth and emotional resonance, highlighting Logan's internal struggles and journey towards self-acceptance. Your mistake was to believe that a life without end can have no meaning. The film ends with an after credit scene of Logan at an airport where he encounters Magneto and a very alive Charles Xavier. And this leads them into X-Men Days of the Future Past, which brought together the original X-Men cast, the original X-Men director Brian Singer, and the younger versions that were introduced in X-Men First Class. A movie that still squeezed in a great Wolverine cameo. Go fuck yourself. Jackman's seventh appearance as Wolverine served as the bridge between these two timelines, showcasing his adaptability and central role in the X-Men universe. Working with both the original and the new cast was a highlight for Jackman. The film required him to maintain his physical condition while delving into a more nuanced performance that balanced action with the emotional gravity of the storyline. The film was a commercial and critical success with many praising Jackman's ability to anchor the ensemble cast. His portrayal of Wolverine Wolverine's resilience and leadership was a real standout, reaffirming his status as a fan favorite. Okay, so now let's dive back into the comics to talk about The Death of Wolverine, which was written by Charles Soule and illustrated by Steve McNiven and released in 2014. Wolverine gets hit with this microverse virus that shuts down his healing factor, making him mortal. Mr. Fantastic steps in and offers to try fixing it, but Wolverine decides to accept vulnerability. Now, however, his enemies finally have a real shot at killing him and someone has put a bounty on his head. That man is Abraham Cornelius. Along the way on his hunt to find Cornelius, Logan clashes with old foes like Nuke, Viper, and Sabretooth, navigating a perilous path marked by betrayal, and his quest culminates in a showdown at Cornelius's facility in Paradise Valley. Cornelius taunts Logan while unleashing his machines on test subjects, praising his creation, Sharp. Amid the chaos, Logan disables Sharp and disrupts Cornelius's attempts to merge with adamantium, covering himself with the metal in the process. Logan catches up with Cornelius before the adamantium engulfs him. Reflecting on his arduous journey, Logan kneels in the sunset, passing leadership of the X-Men to Storm, leaving them mourning but determined to carry forward in his indomitable spirit. Charles Soule wanted to create an ending that stood out from typical superhero fare. Instead of Wolverine meeting his end in a massive fight scene, Soule aimed for a more meaningful conclusion. He envisioned Wolverine's exit to evoke a sense of heroism and reflection, allowing him to ride off into the sunset in a way that felt fitting for such a storied character. However, Wolverine's popularity ensured that he would return. Soule would also get the privilege to write that return 
returned in 2018's The Return of Wolverine. Soul wrote a build-up called Hunt for Wolverine, where the X-Men had initially set up a public grave using the shell and secretly buried Wolverine's body in Canada after Kitty phased his corpse out of the shell. But later they discover that his real grave is empty. In The Return of Wolverine miniseries, Logan is resurrected in an amnesiac state by an unidentified force, eventually learning that Persephone is behind his revival. Wolverine discovers her plans to use mind control entities for global domination. Escaping to a space station, he faces off against Persephone's forces in a final showdown determined to stop her apocalyptic scheme. Essentially, Logan is trying to stop Persephone from turning the rest of the world into mindless killing machines, which in a way is him conquering his own past of being turned into a mindless killing machine by the Weapon X program. So despite emerging victorious, Wolverine returns to the X-Men with scars both physical and emotional, grappling with his tumultuous past and uncertain future, probably seeing a pattern in Wolverine's story. Like most comic book characters, he is never allowed true change. Even when he makes progress and finds peace, events always conspire to make him more tortured. I mean, fundamentally, Logan is immortal, so his suffering can never truly end. But that idea was finally put to rest in James Mangold's 2017 masterpiece, Logan. Logan is set in the near future, when an aging Wolverine protects a young mutant X-23. This film was loosely inspired by Soul's comic, The Death of Wolverine, and Millar's Old Man Logan Run. The film was intended as Hugh Jackman's swan song as the character. Logan is depicted as an older, warier version of himself in a dystopian future, caring for an ailing Professor X, and the two of them protect a young mutant, Laura X-23, Wolverine's biological daughter. Logan was a deeply personal project for Jackman. He worked closely with Mangold to create a story that honored Wolverine's legacy while offering a fitting conclusion. The decision to depict Logan's physical and emotional decline added a layer of realism and depth that's rarely seen in superhero films. Don't be what they made you. For his final performance, Jackman left no stone unturned. He adopted a grueling training regimen and a strict diet to portray an older, more vulnerable Logan convincingly. The physical toll of the role was significant, but Jackman's dedication ensured a powerful and authentic portrayal. Logan was a critical and commercial success, hailed as one of the best superhero films ever. It was nominated for a Best Screenplay Oscar. Jackman's performance was also universally praised, with many critics and fans moved by the raw emotional depth that he brought to the character's final chapter. Jackman's portrayal was also recognized with several award nominations, cementing his impact on the character and on this genre. It was a poignant and fitting end to Jackman's tenure, praised for its depth, emotional gravity, and mature themes. It brought together aspects of Logan's evolution through the comics, combining his haunted past from Weapon X to the excellent old man Logan run. And in the end, the prophecy from the Wolverine came true. I see you on your back. There's blood everywhere. You're holding your own heart in your hand. So in 2017, Disney acquired 20th Century Fox, which returned the film rights of the X-Men and Deadpool properties to Marvel Entertainment. Now this freed up the Fox Marvel characters to become part of the Marvel Cinematic Universe. This opens up endless possibilities for crossovers and new story arcs. Enter X-Men 97 and Jackman's return as Wolverine in a Deadpool film. X-Men 97 was one of the greatest X-Men adaptations of all time. In an overstuffed 10 episode first season, the X-Men face a mutant genocide on Genosha, traitors in their own ranks, and an adaptation of fatal attractions when Magneto pulls adamantium from Wolverine's body. But the show perfectly encapsulated Wolverine's suffering as an unrequited lover in one scene, where Jean actually makes a move on him. You're Jean Grey. He's Scott Summers. Those are the rules. Now back in the comics, the X-Men underwent their biggest change in decades. Moira McTaggart is revealed to be a mutant living through a time loop. She convinces all mutants, heroes and villains, to unite and form a mutant nation on the island of Krakoa, which began the Krakoan Age. Now this was a big era for the X-Men in Marvel Comics, spanning from 2019 to 2024, starting with Jonathan Hickman's House of X and Powers of X miniseries, and then including four main phases, Dawn of X, Reign of X, Destiny of X, and Fall of X. During this time, over 500 issues were published across 80 different series. Like, I'm actually still getting caught up on them. One major change was the introduction of the Resurrection Protocols, which made the X-Men functionally immortal. The series reimagined everything we knew about the X-Men and also pushed Wolverine into unknown territory. In the X-Lives of Wolverine and X-Deaths of Wolverine storylines written by Benjamin Percy, they kicked off the second Krakoan age with Wolverine traveling through time to save Charles Xavier. During his journey, Wolverine revisits moments from his forgotten past. 
Christ. It's revealed that he was present at Xavier's birth, indirectly saving the family from Omega Red, who had possessed the Xavier family staff. Omega Red's goal was to assassinate Xavier, aiming to prevent the formation of the X-Men. During the Hellfire Gala storyline, Wolverine decides to spend quality time with his biological daughter, Laura, and her clone Gabby, who goes by Scout, and his biological son, Dokken. Now, during this run, Logan also lives in the same living quarters with Jean and Scott, but they're not in a thruple, according to Tom Brevoort, Marvel Comics Executive Vice President and new X-Men Group Editor. The fans, though, think otherwise. I mean, look at how their rooms are connected. I mean, at least it's confirmed that Logan and Jean have a private moment in a hot spring. The upcoming X-Men from the Ashes is going to relaunch the X-Men series, marking the end of that Krakoan age and closing out a hugely successful run for Marvel. The final issue of Fall of X previewed the upcoming relaunch with Xavier you're witnessing mutants trying to reintegrate into human society. Now, Wolverine will, for now, be part of the Uncanny X-Men lineup with Rogue as the team lead and headquartered in New Orleans. And this series is going to focus on the X-Men as outlaw heroes. But recently, one legend has returned to Marvel to write Wolverine, and that is Chris Claremont. With 2024 being Wolverine's 50th anniversary, Marvel invited Chris to write a direct sequel to his story with Jim Lee, Wolverine Magipore Knights, teaming Logan back up with his old friends Captain America and Black Widow. The story picks up from the classic classic Uncanny X-Men 268. Chris is also currently writing a sequel to the series that he did with Al Milgram. That's not all, he will also be writing another comic with Logan called Wolverine Deep Cut. Logan is heading out from the Outback on a high-stakes mission, leaving the remnants of the X-Men behind. Finally, after years of mystery, Chris Claremont is going to reveal what Wolverine was up to right before his epic fight with the Reavers. The first issue is, if anyone ever wanted to see the Wolverine Sabretooth fight, this will give you some unexpected moments. And that brings us to Hugh Jackman's return to the claws and Deadpool and Wolverine. Even though he always intended Logan to be his swan song, the chemistry between Deadpool and Wolverine in the comics has, it's like such a great dynamic. Jackman's return fulfills a long-standing desire among fans to see these two characters interact on the big screen. And with Disney's acquisition of 20th Century Fox, the X-Men and Deadpool properties are now part of the MCU. This opens up endless possibilities for crossovers and new story arcs. Jackman's return as Wolverine in a Deadpool film could serve as a bridge for integrating mutants into the MCU, paving the way for future appearances. Fingers crossed we might finally see Hugh Jackman's Wolverine fight the Hulk. Now, in addition to Hugh Jackman getting to play with all the other characters in the MCU, he could also provide a seamless transition and endorsement for a new actor taking on the role for future MCU films if the universe is rebooted following Avengers Secret Wars. Over 17 years and nine films, Jackman brought depth, intensity, and raw physicality to this character, making Wolverine a household name and a cornerstone of the X-Men film franchise. Accepting someone new won't be easy, but his involvement could help audience members acclimate to a new face. Without X-Men 1, there wouldn't be a Spider-Man. And without Spider-Man, there wouldn't be an Iron Man. And without Iron Man, where would the Marvel film universe be? Wolverine's journey from a secondary character in The Incredible Hawk to a leading figure in the Marvel Universe is a remarkable story of evolution and resilience. He is one of Marvel's best-selling characters, consistently topping sales charts in solo and team books. His popularity stems from his iconic design, complex characterization, and mysterious past, which resonate deeply with readers. Uh, why does Wolverine's legacy endure? Because we are a Wolverine in some ways, right? He's got a piece of us, and so we all have a little bit of like protective mechanisms inside us it's part of our tribal background it's part of what makes us human and that's why some of these characters are so core and wolverine just hits that little piece where all of us have been that person that, that despite the odds would still keep going. Wolverine's versatility makes him the perfect character for all kinds of stories, whether he's on a solo mission or teaming up with other heroes. He's been a key player in the X-Men, X-Force, Alpha Flight, the Fantastic Four, and the Avengers. Through comics, cartoons, movies, and video games, Wolverine has become a symbol of strength, complexity, and raw power. Logan's legacy is as sharp and enduring as his claws, ensuring his place is a cornerstone of the Marvel Universe. And we wouldn't have it any other way, bub. So guys, long story long, this has been the definitive, extensive, complicated history of Wolverine. Special thanks to Chris Claremont, Fabian Nisi, and Paul Jenkins for contributing to this video, and special thanks to the writer Bevan, you can find her social links below. So guys, let me know what you think. What's your favorite version of Wolverine? What's your favorite Wolverine story? Let me know in the comments or at me on Twitter. And if it's your first time here, welcome to the channel. Please subscribe and smash that bell for alerts. For Screen Crush, I'm Ryan Airy.